So this is our final talk on checkpoint therapy. Um, Alan Yagoda was really one of the uh, premier GE oncologists of the 1980s. And you know, I think it's kind of uh, a tribute to him that it's taken us so long to really uh, come up with new treatments for this disease. And <clears throat> we really went about 15 years, actually tw about 20 years until we developed new treatments since the development of MVAC. Let me just move ahead here. So um, checkpoint therapy is approved in the United States for both platinum ineligible as well as platinum eligible urethelial carcinoma. Atezolizumab and pembrolizumab are approved by the FDA frontline. This was granted accelerated approval in May of 2017. We have five checkpoint inhibitors approved for second line therapy, including atezolizumab, nivolumab, dervalumab, and nivolumab. And Pembro, the only one that has full approval is Prembo, and that's based upon a randomized phase three trial. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go into the first two approvals for platinum and ineligible disease, atezolizumab and pembrolizumab. The Invigor 210 trial was a large phase two trial that had two different cohorts, <clears throat> the first of which was cisplatinum ineligible patients, and the criteria included no prior treatment uh, with chemotherapy for metastatic urethelial carcinoma, ECOG 0 to 2, or renal impairment, grade 2 or uh, uh, 2 hearing loss or peripheral neuropathy, or greater, and an ECOG performance status of 2. So uh, when we look at the uh, cohort 1 patients, uh, 119 patients, objective response rate of 23%, a survival of approximately 15 months, we see a disconnect between PDL1 expression and overall survival. In other words, it does not correlate uh, in this particular data set. That's different from what we see in the second line setting. The Keno 52 trial uh, uh, got pembrolizumab approved in the same setting. Uh, the difference being uh, that uh, uh, the uh, only other criteria for this drug was New York Heart Association class three uh, or two congestive heart failure. And Pembro was given a 200 milligrams uh, every three weeks. And again, the same response rate, objective response rate of approximately 23%, complete response rate of 7%, and no survival data has yet been reported. Five drugs, as I mentioned before, approved in uh, uh, second-line therapy. Uh, tezeluzumab was the first to be approved based upon uh, the second cohort of the Invigor 210 trial, 310 patients with platinum-treated disease, and uh, they had to have progression uh, and had to be within two years of, of the initial therapy, ECOG performance status of 0 or 1, and a creatinine clearance of greater than 30. Now, as in, in contrast to what I mentioned before with the patients who were platinum ineligible, we do see a correlation with PDL1 expression. Uh, there's a greater survival in those patients of high levels compared to those patients of no expression or low level levels of expression. We still do see responses in those patients who are PDL1 negative. It's about 11%. Uh, we do have long-term follow-up data, and this is actually going to be published in JAMA Oncology within the next couple of weeks. Uh, this was presented at ASCO GU last year. This is from our Phase 1 experience. And what we found was we looked at the Phase 1 data, and we found that the objective response rate was 50%. It actually was up higher than it was on the initial report. And in the low patients, it's 17%. And uh, again, a better survival by PDL1 status uh, of about 10 months uh, for those patients who have uh, PDL1 high uh, versus about eight months for those patients who have a lower level of PDL1 expression. Now, uh, when we start looking at baseline characteristics, as I mentioned in the previous talk, the one group that does not seem to do as well with checkpoint inhibition therapy are those patients with hepatic metastases. These are primarily patients with good performance status and predominantly nodal disease. Now, <clears throat> these patients are treated until progression, and um, I think it's important to note that the majority of the side effects are seen within the first year of treatment. Uh, we start seeing these di diminish over time, and no serious adverse events are reported past year one. Um, now, uh, the Invigor 211 trial was supposed to confirm these observations. This was run predominantly in Europe by Tom Pals. It randomized 767 patients to uh, chemotherapy with vinflunin in Europe. It was docetaxel or paclitaxel in the United States. And this was compared to a Now, the trouble with this trial is the design. 
we were all convinced because of the phase two data that the PDL1 expression uh, correlated with a better outcome as far as survival was concerned. So the stratified uh, method came, was designed to uh, have a lower accrual, or at least need fewer patients for uh, the exact uh, the result that we wanted to be seen, which was a survival benefit. So if in the PDL1 positive patients, the primary endpoint was met, which was overall survival. Uh, you could proceed on to all, uh, all patients uh, or, or patients who were, uh, a P, uh, who were uh, uh, PDL1 negative as well. So it was intent to treat, uh, and then PFS by intent to treat, uh, but you had to be positive to go on to these two next areas for overall survival uh, of patients, all patients treated on the study. And lo and behold, when you look at the IC23 population, you don't see a difference. Now, there are a couple of things that are important to point out here. Number one, it was, as was mentioned earlier, PDL1 can be predictive for response, but it's also a prognostic factor. So it could be that the high levels of PDL1 portended for a better prognosis, and that's the reason why survival benefit was not seen. Secondly, this was predominantly vinflunin as far as chemotherapy was concerned, but look at the survival on the chemotherapy arm. Normally, we see about a seven to eight month survival with chemotherapy. So that's actually better than what you would expect it. So there is something a little bit fluky about this design that may have led to the fact that this was not showing any difference in survival. If you look at the overall survival analysis by uh, all, all, all comers, there does seem to be a difference. Had the trial been powered to do this properly, uh, they would have had a, a, a hazard ratio of 0.85 and the p-value was 0.038. So this is unfortunate, um, and uh, although do I personally believe that there are differences in the checkpoint inhibitors, the answer is no, but the only one that does have a difference or phase three positive study is uh, uh, pembrolizumab, and we'll get into that data in a few moments. Uh, by chemotherapy type, uh, uh, taxanes, uh, there does seem to be a difference in survival ta with, with taxane uh, therapy compared to uh, uh, pd one therapy. So checkmate uh, 275, look at nivolumab, Go through this very, very quickly. Again, very, very similar survivals to what we've seen with the tezolizumab, uh, 8.7 months. Uh, Dervalumab, uh, another phase one trial um, in metastachial urothelial carcinoma. This is given every other week for a year. And again, uh, response rates paralleling what, uh, what we've seen before, maybe a little bit better of a median survival of 18.2 months. But again, that could be related to patient selection. That there, there was a correlation between overall survival and pda one expression with this study. The Danube study is taking a, a, a volume app up front and uh, it's comparing chemotherapy to a volume app plus uh, tremolumumab or a volume app alone. The trial is accrued and we hopefully will have an answer very, very shortly as to survival. Uh, uh, a volume app has also been evaluated in a phase one trial in the Javelin study. And uh, again, uh, no difference in, in, in outcome as far as pdl one status and similar survivals to what we've seen before. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, uh, pembrolizumab is the only uh, checkpoint inhibitor, inhibitor that shows a difference in survival in a phase three trial. Uh, almost identical uh, numbers of patients to what we saw with the, uh, the uh, tezolizumab study. Uh, same uh, control arm, paclitaxel, docetaxel, or vinflunin. And here we do see a survival benefit, uh, again, in favor of pembrolizumab uh, compared to chemotherapy. The chemotherapy arm is more akin to what we would see with, with chemotherapy in this situation. Also a better objective response rate uh, with pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy, but no difference in progression-free survival uh, between the two different arms. And that's, again, a theme that we see with immune therapy. So where are we moving in the future with some of our treatments? Uh, well, as was said in the first talk, adding ipilimumab to uh, nivolumab is one way that this could come about. There is no uh, specific phase two trial has yet been published, but there have been studies that have added ipilimumab at progression, uh, and in 10 patients, this really is very, very small, but one partial response was seen. What I think is a very interesting area of investigation is epicatastat, which um, is a uh, inhibitor of, of tyrosine metabolism. Uh, this actually may reverse some of the mechanisms of uh, uh, what's called IDO or IDO inhibition. Uh, that's a uh, metabolite that will uh, cause immune resistance. And a small uh, trial by Dave Smith, there does seem to be a higher response rate when epicatastat is combined with uh, um, pembrolizumab, and this is now going into randomized trials, both 
upfront uh, in platinum ineligible as well as in second line platinum eligible patients. So we talked a little bit about before about markers and the issue about markers I think is, is, is difficult to really interpret because of the fact that we've got different antibodies. These recognize both tumor cells as well as the immune cells and we do see a correlation between response and the overall outcome. Uh, I think my biggest critique of these studies is that they don't use consistent collection of tissue. And uh, if we're talking about an acute phase reactant or an immune treatment, this may take, uh, uh, may change over time or change after treatment. So, um, uh, so again, there are different assays. They look at different portions of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, stroma as well as the tumor. And um, as you see on the bottom, the tumor standing is the 28-8 antibody. Uh, the SP142, which is the Genentech antibody, only looks at the immune cells. And then both of the 22C3 and the SP263. And these are different staining patterns that you, you would tend to see with this. Uh, on the left would be uh, a 2-3 uh, from the SP142 is strongly positive, again, only in the immune cells. And the bottom are either tumor cells plus the immune cells or the tumor cells alone. Now, uh, we need to look at other biomarkers and, and perhaps looking at the tumor mutational load along with uh, uh, immune um, uh, markers is a way of, of further refining our, our prognostic information or predictive information. Bladder cancer is very similar to melanoma and lung cancer in its mutational rate, and this is thought to be related to why it responds to checkpoint inhibition therapy. Uh, and if we start looking at uh, the different subtypes uh, of bladder cancer um, and mutational loads, we see that there does seem to be a correlation within the individual subgroups uh, of those patients who have higher mutational loads versus those, those patients who have lower mutational loads in terms of how they respond to atezolizumab. And um, there does seem to be an association with overall survival uh, and the mutational load in those patients who are treated with atezolizumab as well. So uh, the ones that do seem to do the best uh, in the situation are those who are the luminal type 2. Uh, this is what's felt to be the inflamed phenotype. Uh, the basals are the, what's called to be, thought to be the immune desert where they don't express a large number of uh, immune cells. And also then the other thing we think about is, is the fact that you do have the immune cells present and it's, it's inhibited by the stroma. So, uh, so again, as we see here, the basals have the stromal component uh, that's inhibiting the immune cells, the luminal type 1s are the deserts, so excuse me, I correct myself on that, and the type 2s are the ones that are inflamed. And I think that's, again, the way we have to start thinking about the disease. Slightly different pattern of response when patients are treated with uh, uh, the uh, with no nivolumab, uh, the basal ones, the basal twos are the ones that have a higher response rate, and also the interferon gene expression does seem to correlate, as we saw with progression, as we saw previously uh, in another talk. So um, I think letting one over the BCG in the interest of time, I'll just skip over this, the non-muscle invasive disease, and. Um, uh, go on to um, some of the other I.O. combinations that are now uh, 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 under investigation. Um, we're looking at a variety of different uh, checkpoint inhibitors. I think the important thing to note about these, when, especially when you combine ipilimumab with nivolumab uh, or uh, a PDL1 plus tremolumumab, is, is your, your side effects basically double uh, when you add a second checkpoint uh, as well. Uh, there are other uh, areas that are being, uh, being investigated particularly OX40, which is on the positive end of the immune system. It's not an inhibitory mo molecule. There was a trial by Genentech that actually got closed. Uh, so uh, there are different portions of the immune system that can be uh, moved forward. We do have a, a, a several adjuvant trials that are being evaluated in post-cystectomy patients. Uh, the one I'll use as an example, and there are trials that are being looked at with pembrolizumab as well as nivolumab, is the NCI trial, which is now open. Uh, this takes patients who have high-risk disease, who have either node-positive disease after surgical resection, uh, greater than P2 disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, or greater than P3 or P4 disease after surgical resection without uh, peri uh, perioperative chemotherapy. Uh, they can't have positive margins. They can't have any evidence of residual disease after surgery. And uh, they're stratified by sites of disease, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and uh, pathologic stage, as well as pdl one status. 
Uh, the endpoint is uh, disease-free and overall survival, and then secondary endpoints are disease-free overall survival uh, in PD and PDL one status. Very simple randomization. Uh, they're stratified by the criteria I mentioned before. Pembrolizumab versus observation, and the Pembro is being given for a year. All the other checkpoint trials are giving one year of, of either a tezolizumab or nivolumab uh, post therapy. Uh, the, these trials also are including patients uh, with upper tract disease uh, in, uh, in, as part of their initial regimens. So in conclusion, checkpoint inhibition therapy demonstrates significant anti-tumor activity in cisplatin-treated metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Phase one and two trials have confirmed initial observations of anti pd one and PD-1 therapy in metastatic disease. And I think that we really need a better understanding of the markers. And what we really need are good consecutive pre- and post-treatment studies and not really rely on archival tissue because I think that's why we're having inconsistent answers. <laughs>